Hello, good afternoon. So I'm Amandine, and I'm going to talk about quantum physics, a concept that might seem out of your reach or even a little boring, but it's actually really interesting. So, oh, it's there, sorry. So quantum physics is the science of matter and energy at an atomic scale, such as like protons and electrons, called subatomic particles. And so quantum physics is coming from Latin, which means packet or how much, which shows that it can be measured. So a quantum is like a packet of light, energy, or any other physical property. And for example, a quantum of light is called a photon, and one of electricity is called an electron. So quantum physics was first discovered by Max Planck in the 1900s. And, but then it was reinforced by many other scientists after him, such as like Albert Einstein, Werner Heisenberg, Richard Feynman, Erwin Schrodinger, and Niels Bohr. And quantum physics are very different from normal classical physics. They're like, it's a whole different world at a smaller scale with a whole different new set of rules. It's like as if there's that big world, like with the objects, big objects, the world where we, li we live, and it kind of belongs to classical physics, the physics that we learn at school. And there's, all, there's that tiny world, like the world of tiny things, which where the quantum physics rule. It might seem contradictory, but quantum and classical physics both try to understand the world and try to explain it to us. And so, I'm going to talk about, to, um, I'm going to tell you about some of the things um, that happened in this world that might seem very unnatural because it's a new world. So the first thing is superposition. And as I said, Erwin Schrodinger, he was one of the developers of quantum physics theory. And his most famous experiment wasn't physically made. It was kind of like a thought experiment to describe superposition. So put simply in classical physics, I can turn right and I can turn left. But in quantum physics, I can kind of turn both sides at the same time. But right now I'm classical physics world, so I can't do that. <laughs> and so Erwin Schrodinger, his thought experiment. So he imagined a cat in a closed box with a radioactive atom that had 50% chance of breaking the vial of poison and by then killing the cat, and 50% chance not to. And so after a certain amount of time, either the vial broke and then the cat died, either the vial didn't break and so the cat was still alive. So until you open the box and kind of measure the cat, it is kind of in a superposition of both alive and deceased states. It's kind of, when you look inside the box, it's as if you, there's this combined future, a dead cat and a live cat, and you kind of need to force it to separate into two. So then the cat now must be either alive or dead. And so put simply, Superposition is when something can do or be two or more things at the same time. Moving on to the second um, thing, oh, sorry. <laughs> the second concept, which is the particle wave. What? Okay, the particle wave duality. Sorry. So, the particle wave duality principle. It is. It shows that light and matter can sh demonstrate the properties of both a wave and a particle. So there's kind of like that quantum place 
where everything are waves. And then there's like the world of big objects, the world of classical physics, where like the wave kind of becomes particles. But then when would the wave become particles and vice versa? There's kind of that measurement barrier, which collapses the wave into a particle. But we do not specifically know how or when it happens. Um, there's Thomas Young. He invented an experiment to explain how particle wave duality works without making your brain explode. So you need like a source of light or matter, such as photons, electrons, or bullets. And then you would have a plank with two narrow slits. And behind it would be a projection screen or an observation screen. So imagine shooting some bullets at the plank. Two straight lines would appear, right? Well, when you do the same, but with electrons, for example, something weird happens. A motif of stripes appear. And this motif of stripes is called an interference pattern, with something that only happens with waves. So the electron would deliver a wave, which would pass through both slits. And then the wave from each slit would kind of overlap each other, creating the interference pattern. So you would kind of send a particle and then get a wave, but then it's weird because you can't just send a particle and then it kind of transforms into a wave, which is very weird, as I said. <laughs> so, but that's actually how the particle wave duality works and what it is. You, it's when you send a particle, but then it kind of transforms into a wave. And when it passes through the slits, it becomes, well, a wave. And so it creates the interference pattern. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is entanglement. So entanglement is kind of when two particles kind of cross onto each other and become entangled, like connected, even though they're separated by vast distances. So suppose a particle can be red or blue. So if you measure one of these particles, and it's red, then the, you know instantly without measuring the other particle that the other particle must be blue. It happens like even separated by millions of kilometers. So say the red particle was in front of me and the other one at the other side of the campus and it would still be blue. And if it was at the other side of country, it would still be blue, it wouldn't change anything. Even though it was at the other side of the galaxy, if this one is red, then the other one must be blue. So entanglements tells you that just by knowing the state of one particle, you immediately know the state of the other, even if you didn't measure it. Um, so now I'm going to tell you about quant the quantum technology and how, more specifically, I believe that quantum physics is our greatest tool. So lots of things that you use every day are made and only exist because of quantum physics. And you might not even realize it. For example, atomic clocks that, can, that are actually keeping extremely accurate time. And they're the base of our GPS. And lasers and transistors which make up every single computer in the world. And also lead, which are used for many things, from brake lights to indicators, passing through everything, mostly. And the CCDs, which are making up like every single digital camera in the world. And also MRI, like a type of x-ray. And nu nuclear power plants. And also solar panels, which can turn sunlight into electricity. So as I said before, most things you use every day are only existing because of the weird properties of quantum physics. It, you might think that it isn't the best yet and we can make better things, but think about all the things that already exist because of it. 
and try imagining with living without it. So I'm going to talk about new, wait, sorry. So I don't have a slide for this, but I'm going to talk about quant nuclear physics. So nuclear physics is just the study of nuclei, but it's also the study of the way they combine and the way they separate. For example, if you could recreate quantum, uh, if you could recreate nuclear fusion, which is the way they combine, then you can, we can make an unlimited source of energy. But we can also make very dangerous things, such as nuclear power plants and nuclear weapons. But nuclear, nuclear physics are an important part in our history and an important part in our knowledge. And even in our past, they were indispensable for many reasons. So now I'm talking about quantum simulation. So quantum simulation is another field where quantum physics is very important because quantum simulation can improve our medicine. Quantum simulation could be our next great advancing technology. It's quantum computers would reproduce incredibly hard and precise molecules and make them react together to form compounds and create curves. And as you may or may not know, quantum molecules and molecules, they are very complex and the way they react even more. Um, I refer to it as making a soup. So you have all these ingredients and you need to understand the way they react together and the way they kind of connect to each other to make a better tasting soup. But sometimes you need to add things in like salts or herbs, and each time you need to taste it again to see if it tastes better or if it tastes worse. Well, making medicine is basically the same. You just need to taste it all over, over and over again to see whether it works. But quantum simulation is kind of zooming into the soup. And, and you would know without even tasting it whether it tastes good or it tastes bad because it would, the quantum simulation would show you the properties of the soup. And because it shows you the properties, you don't need to taste it to know whether it tastes good or bad. So this method would be a lot less time consuming and it would as it would save a lot of time, it, we could make more cures, and we might even find a cure to cancer. And so, because we need very, to make quantum simulation, we need very powerful quantum computers. And the main thing about quantum computers are qubits. So qubits are very different from normal quantum, uh, computer bit. So qubit is short form for quantum bit. And imagine like a bit is just like a rectangular form and one end is one and the other end is zero. And it's like a switch. It can either be one or it can either be zero. It can't be like, there's no quarter, there's no half, there's no third. But a qubit is more like of a sphere. And then because it's a sphere, it could have lots more probability and possibilities so, for example, imagine there's an arrow pointing somewhere in the sphere. And if the arrow was pointing closer to zero, then there would be high probability of the um, qubit being zero. And if the arrow is pointing closer to one, then there would be higher probability of the qubit being one. But the thing is that sometimes it points in the middle, and that's why qubits also allow, super, allow superposition. The fact that something can do or be two or more things at the same time. It's, it's like you don't actually know what the qubit is before you use it and before you measure it. It's like it can be either zero or one, but there, there are sometimes high probabilities and sometimes lower probabilities. And that's what make it so powerful. And so now I'm going to talk about why I 
believe that quantum physics is our greatest tool, even though that's pretty much the whole speech. It's quantum physics has improved like our technology, our medicine, and our computers. And sometimes it might seem a little crazy, but it will help us understand the world around us better. And so because of all these things I explained to you, I believe that quantum physics is truly and fundamentally our greatest tool. Thank you. <laughs>